Hi YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art, and I'm going to read the rest of chapter 4 in, in this book, uh, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Tamplin and Goffin. We're on chapter 4, the title of the chapter is Protection Policy Against Future Pollution. We are on page 48. The subtitle is A Recommendation for Pollution Control. This then brings us to the means of controlling pollution. The reason we have pollution is that it is permitted either by law or by the absence of law. As was stated earlier, if there was a legal limit or no limit to pollution, any nonsensical industry can pollute. A legal limit to pollution either implies that there is a safe level of contamination or that the process of polluting has a benefit to society that outweighs the attendant risk. We have no evidence whatsoever to indicate that there is a safe level of any form of pollution. Moreover, when a legal limit is established, pollution occurs without any balancing of benefits versus risks. So, do you get that sentence? When a legal limit is established, pollution occurs without any balancing of benefit versus risk. Hmm. To properly protect the public health and safety, the law should read that the acceptable limit of pollution is zero and that the privilege of releasing a pollutant to the environment must be negotiated. The prospective polluter should be required to demonstrate in a meaningful manner that his activity will produce benefits to those affected that outweigh the risk. This weighing of benefit versus necessary risk should occur in public hearings before pollution control boards. It is important to emphasize the word necessary. The benefits must be outweighed against the necessary risks. The right to overrule a decision of excuse me the right to overrule a decision of the control boards should be reserved for the public through courts or by referendum and this right must be preserved and this right must be reserved permanently so that any prior pollution allowed can be stopped if the public so decides I need some water hang on It has elderberry in it. That's why it's colored. Um, pollution tolerance should be zero. For any questions, as the as let me take this stuff off. For questions such as the preservation of the living environment in a livable world, it is truly discouraging that the public must, must plead for an opportunity to be represented in decision making. No right is closer to the constitutional guarantees than that of a livable environment. Long ago, the burden of proof should have been placed upon the perpetrators of pollution rather than upon his prospective victim. Exactly. It has been the lack of the zero tolerance limit for pollutants that has led to the present serious impasse. We have previously explained how useful the acceptable tolerance limit. Excuse me, I'm going to read that again. We have previously we have previously explained how useful the acceptable tolerance limit concept has been to, and so carefully cultivated by the promoter of technology. Read that once more. We have previously explained how useful the acceptable tolerance limit concept has been to and so carefully cultivated by the promoter of technology, i.e., you know who, Mr. Nuclear Man. The acceptable tolerance concept never had any scientific basis. This was purely the result of opportunism plus ignorance. Wow. 
It should be necessary to fight for the abolition of this. It should not. Oh, my gosh. Let me do that again. Hmm. One, two, three. It should not be necessary to fight, fight for the abolition of this Neanderthal concept of treatment of the environment and its inhabitants. Zero tolerance has always made sense with respect to pollutants. And yet, when it is now proposed, promoters and their disciples view it with disbelief. We've always had a tolerance limit, they argue. Indeed, they have. And this is precisely why we have an environmental crisis. Do you want to stop technological progress, they ask? Our answer is no. We simply want technological progress to serve the needs rather than to serve itself. Circumstances may very well arise where the hazard to society may be greater by impeding certain technologies rather than by allowing them to proceed. The concept of determining if benefits to be received by allowing the privilege of pollution does indeed outweigh the risk of injury from the pollution is a meritous concept. The polluter or potential polluter speaks glibly of this benefit risk calculation, but he has yet to perform the calculations with real numbers. He is quick to state that his particular pollution has the tolerance level that has never yet been proved to produce harmful effects. Three questions then are particularly relevant. Why is it essential that the activity he proposes requires any release of pollutants? Number two, why as much as the tolerance level? Number three, what effort has been made to determine the effects, long-term and short-term, on human beings and the, and the ecology of the pollution at the tolerance level? Promoters convert demand into need. Almost invariably, the answer to the first two questions is that it would be uneconomical to reduce the extent of the pollution. Therein lies the essence of the difficulty. What needs to be asked is, economical for whom? For the vast majority of instances, if not all, it is the economics of instant greed and gain versus the economics of quality of life for large numbers of humans. Since so very many of the products of industry are produced because they can be sold rather than because of anyone's need, the most economical approach in the larger sense would be to prevent that particular activity altogether. The promoter can shuttle back and forth between the terms demand and need with great skill. His forte is to concoct a demand refer to it for a while as a demand, and then to make a subtle transition to a desperate need. And the second question concerning the effort to determine the effects of pollution at tolerance levels is almost always answered as, no effects have been observed in, in spite of careful observation. Careful observation of what? Generally, on deeper probing, it turns out to be a careful observation of nothing at all. If indeed any observations were made, they are usually irrelevant to the problem at hand. It is next to hopeless thus far to get science and technology in the service of polluters to understand the difference between no effect and no effect observed. But it is absolutely imperative that this difference be stressed again and again by the public, for the experts will never do it. The public understands quite well that if an inadequate study is done, no effects may be observed. But the effects are there nonetheless, and they can be devastating. 
Don't worry. What is, what's the statement on every single nuclear problem? No observable effects or no harm to human life. Wow. Even after the concept of zero tolerance for pollutants with negotiation of the privilege to deviate therefrom is codified into law, the public should expect that the risk assessment by the polluter and his experts will always be lower than the real effect. Part of this result, part of this will result from inadequate search for effects. Part will, part will result from the gaps in our biological understanding of at any point in time. And for these reasons, risk estimates should always be sus suspected, should be reviewed with great care in an honest open forum, and should be subject to review in the light of new knowledge. Today tolerance limits Today, tolerance limits of pollution represents nothing other than a hunting license for human beings. Even with zero tolerance levels coupled with specified deviation by negotiation, it is vital for the public to retain the privilege of revocation at any time that the benefit versus risk balance changes in light of new evidence. I'm going to read that first sentence again. That's stunning. Today, tolerance limits of pollution represents nothing other than a hunting license for human beings. Wow. And that, my friends, is the end of Chapter 4. We're headed to Chapter 5, which is a super long chapter. It's like a, th it's a third of the book. Look at this. I'll show you how thick Chapter 5 is going to be. It goes from page 53 to 127. Look at lip service to the public health. A good portion of the book. So we got a long road to go, but lip service to the public health. I thought that was interesting that it's going to take such a super long time. Let me find my glasses. There we are. So anyways, uh, I hope that this reading is beneficial to you guys. I'm making an effort to read it and so that it's, I don't know, not, it doesn't sound horrible. But I've never read a book and I've not really had any experience other than reading my kids. So, uh, but I'm going to pursue, I think this information is really valid. And we need it more than ever now to hear this stuff. So, um... We got to put our courage feet on, man, because the shit's hitting the fan now. And I'm super excited for all the post-ignorance people that are going out to see the Helen Caldecott Symposium. I'll post a link to that. I think that's super great. We need a lot of people there that say they're there from the Post-Ignorance Project. If you go and you're going to be there for the Post-Ignorance Project, please tell that to Helen Caldecott's people when you check in that you saw... Either Lonnie Clark or, or Kevin Blanche. Um, Helen, I've been emailing them so they know us. Anyways, um, I'll end here. And hopefully we'll get some support on the uh, Post Ignorance Project. Even in name only it, when you show up in New York. If you just go there and say, hey, we're here because the Post Ignorance Project told us about your seminar. And we wanted to be here. Um, so I, what I'm trying to do is get us some, um, I guess, exposure, networking, I guess that's what it's called. But the idea is to rattle the cages. So that's the idea. So uh, we're going to tell them um, to stop. Stop the nuclear stuff, man. That stuff is killing us. And we got to stop Fukushima like massively bad, bad, bad. It's like... Okay, so I'm going to say this. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, one, two, three. Okay, YouTubers, I'm going to check out and um, I'm going to post another video. I have some ideas on my head that I need to talk to you about, but I'll, I'll keep this to a minimum. 
Sweet dreams. Put on your courage feet. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.